This is Matt Britton. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the CEO of Suzy, and uh, we are really excited today to uh, really present to you an interesting webinar about the second wave. I mean, I wish there was no second wave, I wish there was no first wave, but we all know we're in a different world. And at Suzy, we've really prided ourselves with helping our partners and our clients and the industry at large really understand all the changes that are going on with the US consumer because the changes have been fast and furious. And so many companies and so many brands and so many business people find themselves often lost in terms of how to make the right decisions. And that's where we think we can add a lot of value given the tool that we have. Um, we have been um, executing these webinars, uh, State of the Consumer webinar, ever since March 6th, right when the pandemic was really first starting to hit us in the United States. Uh, this is now our 15th installment. And we have covered everything in these webinars from the future of New York City, to how people are preparing to back to school, to what people uh, going backwards, their summer travel plans were, uh, to really bring in guests from um, all across the, the industry, uh, specific verticals, etc., really to provide you with as much information as we can. And we made the decision that we're really gonna be double downing on this uh, heading into 2021, because just because the pandemic might not look different, or hopefully one day soon not look this, uh, you know, not appear at all, uh, the change that this is all brought on to consumers is really forever and we want to make sure that we can continue to provide uh, these critical insights um, to the industry so you can expect for us to really continue this uh, in 2021 uh, which we're excited about so today uh, we are going to be reviewing um, a variety of third party and first party data um, the, th the first party data we're going to be reviewing is based on a study that we conducted just on december uh, 3rd so as you know those of you who know the suzy tool it is an on-demand consumer insights tool that really allows our clients from across all industries that have the finger on their pulse of the U.S. consumer and consumers around the world. And for today's webinar, uh, we did conduct a study on December 3rd, uh, 2020, with the sample size of 1,000 Americans. The sample size is directly representative of U.S. consumers uh, working from home and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So hopefully that will be helpful to everyone in terms of understanding the context for the data that we're about to share. Um, and if anybody um, has uh, any questions about Suzy, uh, the really powerful tool that we we've built and are deploying uh, pretty rapidly, uh, let us know, but it's a real-time market research platform um, and we've made a lot of leaps and bounds with uh, the product this year, including Suzy Live, which really enables our customers to execute on-demand qualitative research, whether it's in-depth interviews or virtual focus groups, um, connecting the quantitative research to the qualitative research and really trying to reinvent what it means to be able to give you access to the consumer at your fingertips. Uh, but enough about us, let's talk about the consumer and the second wave and what this all means. So it dawned on me to, to do a, a webinar about the second wave just because, you know, we went through this crazy disruption that happened really through the months of March through, let's call it early May, when no one really knew what was going on. You had, um, you know, people rushing into stores to make sure that they were able to get their toilet paper and basic necessities. Um, you had the news media talking about things like depression. Uh, you know, you, we didn't know how bad this pandemic was going to get. And then around the summer, we kind of got adjusted to what so many people have called the new normal, um, sort of a new way of living and a new way of buying and a new way of sort of behaving as a consumer. And to many people's uh, you know, expectations, as the cold weather um, you know, months hit, as people went back to school, as people tried to sort of settle down and maybe start to take here and there some liberties on what they used to know as their old lives, we've unfortunately started to see a second wave. Some people think it's a third wave because there was a spike uh, in certain areas over the summer. Uh, but for all intents and purposes on a national basis, this is certainly the second wave and, and hopefully the final wave. And you know, there's a lot of differences with the second wave because this is all not new to us. Once you've gone through something in life the first time, in some ways it becomes a lot easier and more expected the second time. And that's obviously what happened here is that we are going to this, uh, I don't wanna call it lockdowns, but new restrictions in terms of uh, our way of life and we're doing so with a lot of knowledge in mind and there's so many more companies and services and support mechanisms now in place that weren't there in the first wave. However, there are so many considerations for businesses in terms of trying to uh, market to this new consumer and, and really understand and communicate with this new consumer and that's exactly why we thought it was incumbent on us to really go deep uh, into this topic. So. Um, 
this was crazy. So I don't know how many people saw this, but this was the Ultra Music Festival. It's a huge uh, electronic music festival that's been going on for over a decade. This happened uh, two weeks ago in Taiwan, this picture. Um, I actually know the producers of the Ultra Music Festival. Um, they never thought that it would be able to be executed this way. Uh, Taiwan did a variety of different things really to get uh, the pandemic under control incredibly quickly. And this was still somewhat controversial that they were able to execute it at this level. But the fact that they could do this and the fact that this was acceptable and even legal is really just mind blowing to me. Um, I tweeted about this and wrote, this is half a world away in so many ways because it's geographically half a world away, but it seems like from, you know, a symbolic standpoint, when can we really get to a point where we're going to see events like this shoulder to shoulder at scale in America? And hopefully it's sooner than we think. But in some ways, this should make us frustrated. But in other ways, it should really give us hope in terms of what is entirely possible right now uh, in terms of turning this thing around. And I thought this was just really, you know, something that was mind blowing to me uh, personally. Um, so how long will COVID last? And, you know, this is crazy. So many people, um, and somebody just actually wrote, I thought we were still in the first wave, just a new crest and never went away. And some of this is just semantics, but the reality is um, in New York City, where I live, there was a point where, you know, the, the new cases were less than 100 people a day. And, you know, we were able to really start to say, OK, maybe we can loosen up a little bit. And now you're seeing the opposite happen. So it is a, just a new wave of concerns. It's a new wave of illness. It's a new wave of this pandemic. And that's what I think it means. Um, semantically, but yes, theoretically, the wave never really did go away. Um, so this is a, 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 a Google a question that's been posted over 7 billion times. How long will COVID last? And when we saw this, we went back actually um, to uh, the, a, a, our first webinar and we asked consumers, when will this all end? This was March 6th. And actually what we saw from consumers is 35%, again, this is back in March, thought that this previous summer we would see a return to normalcy. Uh, wrong, obviously. 25%, um, actually 23%, actually thought it was gonna go away that same spring. So by this previous April or May, it would be gone, which just shows how lost so many people were in terms of the, the severity of what we were facing. 30% at that point thought we, it would be at least until fall, until things got, uh, you know, back to normal, and they were unfortunately all wrong. Um, and 10%, and, and we quoted it this way, still believe that somehow the situation will dissipate during the month of March uh, 2020. Um, and the, obviously that was not even close to right. You know, that was actually the same month it was happening. All these people were basically wrong. Um, because here we are in December and the pandemic is still pretty much part of our lives. So we thought maybe we should ask the same question again. Um, so this is something that we ran today um, at 12 p.m. Um, and we said, when will this all end? Um, and we asked people in the United States. Um, and right now, 28% believe this summer will receive a return to normalcy. 27% think it's going to be um, winter of next year or even later. 17% um, will be the spring, so a little sooner, sooner and 11% are pretty optimistic. They think it's going to be this winter. So you're actually starting to see the reverse now where more people are pushing it even further out or when it first started, uh, more people were actually believing that things were going to end sooner rather than later. I think, you know, we've, the, 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 the vaccines have always sort of been two or three months away, it seems like. So I think right now there's just a lot of distrust at this point that this thing's ever gonna end. And it's just interesting to see how the consumer psyche has shifted uh, overall in terms of consumers really no, not being anywhere near as optimistic when they were, again, this past March when people didn't really know what they were dealing with. Um, this stat has been thrown around a lot of times, but um, 66 days is the amount of days on average it takes to build a habit, um, according to a 2009 study. So we are long past the point right now um, of habit forming. Uh, many things that consumers have done during this pandemic over the last seven, eight months are things now that will definitely be um, a big part of their life moving forward. And that's something that I think that we all really just have to keep in mind uh, as we, you know, kind of try to predict how things are going to change uh, moving forward. Um, schools opening may have sent a signal that things are going back to normal originally, and this was, you know, in September. Um, but again, many people predicted it would come back. And now we see school, school shutting back down again. And, you know, it's it becomes really like, a, you know, an unsolvable solution for municipalities 
everybody wants kids back in school. Nobody wants the pandemic to rage on. And it's just become this political thing. Uh, one thing that we made a decision on a very long time ago is that Susie is not going to be touching politics ever. Um, and that obviously ended up being a good decision. So none of this is um, a political statement. It's just that there is device in this. And in some ways, this is a tough challenge to solve. And I think uh, that's kind of undeniable at this point. Um, you know, this is, I found this this morning and I actually tweeted it. And it really just shows the mixed messages we're facing uh, in the United States right now. Uh, the headline for the story was, there's no reason to wait, cancel your holiday travel plans now. And then look at the banner ad right next to it uh, from the state of Florida. We could all use a little getaway. Um, isn't that emblematic of 2020 in a nutshell? where you have corporate interests you know, at play with the interests of um, the Commonwealth and the interests of local municipalities and often find themselves at odds with each other. And here you have you know, a writer basically saying, look at the data, don't travel. And then you see a business saying, listen, we need to get people in Florida and spending. We could use a little getaway. Maybe you should start your journey and come down here. And that's what consumers are facing right now. And so many consumers are really more than anything else just lost in terms of how to proceed as a result of all this. Um, the vaccine is obviously a huge thing on the mind of consumers. And post-election has become more and more front page news right now. Um, this week, it was announced that next week, um, you know, a couple of days from now, we are going to start to see the first uh, approved use of vaccines in the United Kingdom. And we're probably only two to three weeks away from that actually happening in the United States. So, you know, we talked earlier about the vaccine always seemingly being two to three months away. Well, it's really here right now. It's here. It's in possession. Um, Governor Cuomo in New York just announced that 200,000 vaccines have been shipped to New York for initial use on healthcare workers. Um, so, it's, it's starting to happen, and it'll be really interesting to kind of track this. Um, vaccinations show promise, but obviously, you know, there are uncertainties. And this, this question was really about when people think that they are going to be taking the vaccine, when it's going to be widely distributed. And really, you know, the, no one really knows, right? It, it, this is unprecedented time, uh, you know, in this country and really around the world. So you all know about wave two, whatever you want to call it. And today we're really going to unpack um, what this new wave or this new phase looks like for consumers. We're going to diagnose how people feel. We're going to try to get into the psyche um, of consumers right now. We're going to try to identify how people are thinking and behaving. And then we're going to determine what brands need to be doing um, because so much has ch changed yet so much has stayed the same. And really we want to try to unpack this uh, for everybody. So the first um, part of the presentation is really the emotional wave. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to go into our Ask America section of the presentation. For those of you who don't know what Ask America is, um, given our Suzy On Demand Insights platform, we have the ability to actually ask consumers instantly to give us feedback on any question you have. And we've integrated into uh, this State of Consumer webinar series with really great success and it allows you, uh, the viewer, to tell us what question you want us to ask our uh, panel of U.S. consumers. So this is an opportunity for you to actually uh, vote. And you can see on your screen right now the ability to vote for one of four questions that we're going to be asking consumers. First, um, what brands have helped you make feel the most safe during COVID-19? Two, do you want brands to do more to help you have fun at home? Three, what emotions do you want people seeing in advertisements? And four, how much of your emotions impact your spending behaviors uh, during this pandemic? So you can go ahead uh, and pick the question that you want to see us uh, most answer with our audience. Um, and we will now go into uh, the first part of our presentation. So to no surprise, people are worried and they're stressed and anxious, not only from themselves, but their family. You know, we ask how they're feeling right now and there's just anxiety, there's uncertainty, um, there, there's concern, there's economic concerns that are happening, um, you know, without a doubt in many pockets of the United States, although some of us aren't as exposed to it as others. Um, so there's just a lot of anxiety. 2020 has sucked and there's really no way around it at this point. 74% um, of consumers, however, feel prepared for the second wave of the pandemic. Um, they feel that they've seen it before. They feel there's far less uncertainty. Uh, many consumers have readjusted their finances. They've readjusted their living situation. They've readjusted their expectations for what the world actually looks like. And because of that, they definitely feel more prepared for the second wave uh, of the pandemic. And, and in many ways, that's a good thing, right? Um, information is definitely more accessible right now. Um, you know, Without a doubt, 
the municipalities, businesses, people have really caught up. We were really largely blindsided when this kind of uh, first happened across the board. Testing centers are easy to find. Uh, nearly half people feel testing centers are more accessible. Um, it's nowhere near as accessible as we all thought it would be. Uh, but you know, many schools are, are getting their hands on tests, many workplaces, um, and testing has definitely gotten better. It hasn't solved the issue, but that's sort of undeniable. Uh, 66 or two thirds of consumers feel that they feel the same level of nervousness though, um, just because about the implications of what's happening. So although they feel that there's more, I guess, guardrails around what's happening, there's still a level of anxiety amongst consumers, despite the fact that we're getting the vaccine news, um, despite the fact that they've kind of adjusted to this new life, uh, that anxiety still exists. Um, wave two is consumers feeling more exhausted and frustrated than wave one. Um, they're frustrated because it's gone so long at this point. And many people have lost sight because we talked about 66 days to adopt a new habit. Many people have like long lost the habit of being optimistic, right? Or long lost the habit of feeling excitement or optimism. So they may think that it's never going to come back again. And uh, it will come back again, um, but this is really kind of create different emotions. Maybe the fear is not there anymore, but it's brought on a whole new range of emotions. Uh, over 60% of consumers feel somewhat at ease right now because they have adjusted and they've kind of adopted a new comfortable lifestyle. We'll get to what that means um, in a second. But you know, it, the, the, that comfort doesn't necessarily replace the issues that, that they're facing and feeling. And that's something that um, is it's something that we really shouldn't, uh, you know, disregard. I'm going to make myself a little bit smaller so you guys can see the slides. Um, it's really great, by the way, having people give comments and stuff because I can just adjust in real time. It's how we roll at Susie. Um, the impact of the economy still has consumers worried uh, right now. Uh, over 70% are still concerned about the negative impact it's having um, on the economy. You know, many of us are, are misguided uh, by the stock market. And you know, I saw a stat today that 1% of the United States population owns 50% of all the stocks in terms of shareholding. Um, and so that, that really means that it's not really about Main Street, Wall Street. It's about really um, you know, the 1%. So when we see the stock market rise, we might feel good about that, but it really is no indicator on wealth more broadly um, amongst Americans. And I think it's very important uh, to keep in mind. But despite all this, we're seeing things like record sales on Cyber Monday. I mean, so many venture capitalists and investors, when this first happened in March, I mean, I got letters saying, you know, you really have to worry about a depression and, and you're going to have to fire people and this and that. And we were a fortunate company, right? And we've been growing dramatically at Suzy uh, this year, maybe in part because we're doing things like this. Um, many companies aren't so lucky to no fault of theirs. But regardless, here we are right now, um, you know, that same year, and you're seeing record sales on Cyber Monday. Uh, nearly $11 billion was spent online. So certainly people aren't fearing a depression or we would not obviously seeing numbers like this. Um, and speaking of uh, e-commerce, we're doing um, a deep dive into e-commerce uh, next week uh, with a partner, Micmac. If you, none of you know uh, Rachel Tipograph, who's the founder and CEO of Micmac, she is a brilliant thinker, brilliant mind, especially in the e-commerce world. And we're going to have a deep dive into e-commerce and holiday shopping habits. So um, definitely sign up for that um, if you haven't yet. It's going to be a different type of webinar. We're really going to have more of a discussion, and I'm really going to try to unpack um, her beautiful mind and try to help you guys understand what she's seeing in the e-commerce world. So looking forward to that. So let's get into the behavioral shifts. And, and first, we're gonna go into our Ask America, uh, one of four questions uh, you want us to ask our audience. One, are you more comfortable traveling during the second wave of COVID-19? Two, how comfortable are you dining indoors now? Three, what activities are you doing to be more creative during the second wave? And four, do you want brands to help you stay more active during this current phase? So I'll let you guys take a second to answer that. And we will dive right into um, our next section. So this is something that I put together. I'll actually make it a little larger so you guys can see it. But um, it's really about what I'll call the trade-off of consumers um, in 2020 because it's not all bad, right? We are seeing kind of a trade-off with consumers where they are embracing more comfort. And what do I mean by that? It means that they're saving more. We'll be talking about that. They're spending more time at home, more time with family, 
they have more time than ever before. So time was something that they had the least of, right? And now it's something they're finding they have the most of. Um, they're having more time and money um, than ever before in many instances, and the data really shows that. They're having more time to do things like go to doctor's appointments and, and take care of themselves. Um, and more time to connect with people, not necessarily physically or emotionally, but over tools like Zoom, catch up with friends, take inventory of their life. So we're seeing consumers with more comfort overall. But that's coming with a real trade-off, and it's coming with the trade-off of far less excitement, right? The excitement, the intrigue, the serendipity, the romance of our lives has really gone out the window in 2020. We're not celebrating as much. We're not traveling. We're not going to live events. We're not dining. Uh, people aren't dating as much. There's less serendipity and mystery in terms of running into that person on the street or having unexpected occurrences. Um, nothing is going to happen unexpectedly when I walk from my bedroom to my home office in the morning. Right? Maybe I'll trip over my dog Phoebe's toy, but that'll basically be it, right? There's nothing really unexpected. Where when you go on a subway, maybe, you know, somebody could attack you. No, just kidding. Maybe something could happen that you don't expect. Maybe you could run into somebody. Uh, maybe you'll have a cup of coffee from a local uh, cart, coffee cart you never had before, whatever it may be. So we are more comfortable than ever before in a lot of ways, but we've had far less emotional excitement um, and invigoration. And naturally, the trade-off that we really have to think about as we look into how this is all going to play out as the pandemic hopefully fades away uh, moving forward. Um, brands right now have a role of, of being an enabler. Um, I, I talk about this a lot in terms of what Home Depot said, you can do it, we can help, right? About enabling consumers to do it on their own. And this isn't really central to how Home Depot market itself anymore, but I think uh, you know this is really prescient in terms of how brands can play a role with consumers. And especially right now as service options has dwindled and consumers are left to their own devices, whether it's changing your oil on their car or cutting your hair or grooming your pet. So many consumers have sought not only the, the materials of brands, but the advice of brands, but less so the services, right? Because consumers don't want people in their house performing those services, so they're figuring out how to do it on their own. And that really changes the relationship between brand and consumer um, in, in terms of here it is, we're gonna do it all for you to here's the stuff you need, we're gonna teach you how to do it. We're gonna give you um, a fishing pole instead of a fish, so to speak. And I think this is a major change that we're gonna to start to see as consumers feel more empowered. Um, consumers are arming their homes with more technology, and some of this is more space than ever before, and the access to information and learning is unlike ever before. And again, it's really bringing an entire new element, uh, an era of consumer empowerment. Um, in that regard, over 80% of consumers have made improvements during the pandemic in their home. And that's no surprise given that the home is now the gym and it's now the bar and it's now the school and it's now the workplace, et cetera, et cetera. And we've seen a massive boom, obviously, uh, in real estate, partly fueled by the uh, record low interest rates. Um, consumers obviously not spending money in their pie chart or their expenditures on things like travel. As such, they're redirecting expenditures towards their home. And that's why we are seeing um, companies like Wayfair and companies like, um, you you know, Bed Bath and & Beyond and, um, you know, the list goes on and on. Obviously, Amazon having record years this year because, you know, consumers are re-looking at, at their home. It, it now has become a sanctuary to them. And as we go back into a world where com companies will have offices, I think it's safe to say that people, regardless, will not be going into the office, you know, the same amount that they have prior to this. Some companies, we, Susie will have an office, but I'm not going to expect our employees to come in five days a week. Some may, some may come in one day a week, and I think that's okay. But as consumers spend more time at home, they're gonna be putting money where their time is being spent. I think this is something that's gonna continue coming out of this. Um, cleaning, it obviously has taken a renewed force. I mean, the cleaning companies like Clorox and Lysol, um, and, you know, and even obviously Purell, much like cleaning oriented, uh, sanitization oriented brands, obviously have had a year that they never have dreamed of. Um, Procter & Gamble, um, you know, rose as it reports uh, uh, broad growth. And, and they wrote, you know, not showing that, that P&G is seeing that this is going to be, and P&G is obviously one of the smartest marketers, uh, you know, brand builders in the world and has been uh, for quite some time. What they're saying is this is going to continue into 2021 because not only did they re report incredible growth, while many companies are not issuing uh, guidance and forecasts for next year, P&G's 
raising their forecast in 2021. They're seeing through their research, their intimate knowledge of the consumer that this cleaning uh, craze is only going to continue uh, moving forward as consumers kind of reevaluate what's important, uh, prioritize cleaning their homes, and again, spending more time in their homes. And people, when we talk about like decorating their homes, it's not always with large appliances and Pelotons. They're doing decorations. You're seeing companies like Etsy just absolutely explode this year because people are looking at their home as a reflection of themselves and they want to be in the place that makes them feel good. And because of it, they are getting those little decorations or new linens or small appliances in the home that actually let the home feel more comfortable for them and a better reflection of who they are. We've talked so much about cooking and, and how the food and beverage industry, in my opinion, has been probably the one of the biggest impacted industries uh, for the long haul. But over half of consumers are spending more time cooking or baking right now. That was as high as 80% in some of our recent webinars. Uh, and many consumers through this are going to start to realize that cooking is a lost art and eating at home is a lost art. Um, I believe that it's going to come at the expense of food delivery. So you probably see companies, you know, Postmates got acquired by Uber, DoorDash has record earnings right now and they're going public. And people think that the, that the kind of online food delivery, and I'm not talking about grocery delivery, because I look at grocery delivery as really an extension of eating at home. When you're talking about takeout and food delivery, I think that's going to be what suffers the most coming out of it. Meaning, I think consumers are going to look at their, you know, their eating experience as almost a barbell. We're either going to stay at home and cook our own food, or we're going to go out to restaurants that have that emotional, social connection. And I think it's going to come at the expense of people ordering in food. So I, I, I think that's going to be a big shift that we're obviously going to see moving forward. Uh, over 40% is spending more time on social media during the second wave. Duh. Obviously, people are sitting around, staring at their phones all day. It's always within reach. It's so hard to put away such an issue at, for kids in terms of the addiction and it's no surprise that this is actually continuing to grow it's interesting in social media though because you know i wrote a book called youth nation on millennials about six years ago and i recently reread it um it's, it's kind of scary to rewrite a book that you wrote six years ago because first of all there's so many things that aren't true anymore you can't update it like a blog so many things i probably wouldn't have written um some things were pretty spot on in terms of some of the predictions I made. And but one thing I really pushed on in this book was about the experience economy and how experiences were how people were defining their personal brands in the millennial era and how travel was having a massive boom. And, you know, it just seems so crazy that's been shut off as a result of it. But you saw influencers and travel influencers really be such a driver of purchases, especially consumer discretionary purchases uh, during that era. And now here we are when we're all stuck at home and you're seeing instead a Netflix show. Um, if, and if you guys haven't seen The Queen's Gambit, it's an incredible show on Netflix, but it's a Netflix show about a female um, chess champion and she is now the new influencer, right? It's not somebody going and Instagramming pictures of them at Ibiza, right? It's somebody that's, um, you know, a, a former chess champion. And here she is in the, the show, booming sales of chess. And chess is something that me and my son have gotten into a lot recently. Um, and it's kind of showed the new power, you know, with a world that's uh, devoid of these travel influencers and people being able to travel. It shows that it doesn't mean influence doesn't exist anymore. It's just going to manifest uh, in far different ways. Um, I, I talked a lot about what Travis Scott did with Fortnite. And anybody who has a kid, say, age 10 to 16, knows Fortnite and in some ways probably hates Fortnite because it's so very addicting to their kids. But, um, you know, Travis Scott, uh, who is an incredible, um, you know, uh, pop hip hop star um, who not only helped McDonald's really reinvent themselves. If, if you haven't seen what Travis Scott's done with McDonald's in terms of uh, boosting their sales in terms of a, a branded collaboration, take a look at that afterwards. But Travis Scott decided to do um, a live concert and a weekend concert within the Fortnite platform. And that, that concert drew 13 million people over the first weekend and to date has had 28 million fans come onto the Fortnite game and interact with Travis Scott's uh, crazy avatar that's floating all over the place. And I've experienced it. It's really cool. Um, you know, 28 million fans, and it, and it basically generated $20 million for Travis um, with the endorsements and the related fees. And I thought this tweet by Dan Runcy, um, somebody who was just turned on to following, it, it's really incredible when you think about it. So here Travis Scott did a tour in 2018, 2019, 
which included four months of travel around the world, 58 live shows. He only reached 850,000 fans. And yes, he made three times the money, but for one weekend of filming and no travel, here he is making $20 million. And, you know, I can tell you from somebody who's running a software company that I look at the virtual event, you know, everything like right now, what we're doing, not to get too meta, but this thing we are doing right now will drive business for us because we are talking about Susie, but we're also adding value and certain people watching this, hopefully all of you will want to talk to us afterwards about what Susie does. We don't have to send people to CES or the Con Film Festival or South by Southwest to drive business anymore. We can do things like this. And I think from a business standpoint, you're going to see so many CEOs like myself and people like Travis Scott, who are much cooler um, and more hip and younger than myself, find uh, new business opportunities coming out of this to really be able to reinvent themselves. And I just thought this was fascinating what um, you know Dan put together in terms of uh, what happened. So uh, that was incredible. Other things in terms of home besides the video game and things like that, you know, people obviously are really starting to find that this pandemic has had quite a toll on their health. Um, the quarantine 15 is something you've probably heard some people say. And obviously fitness has now taken, you know, a renewed um, interest for consumers, um, especially when they can't go to gyms. Um, over 40% of consumers are saying they plan to exercise more during the second wave. Um, we all know that in January, it's when most consumers have new year, new you, and they're talking about, you know, how they're going to give a renewed focus on health. We'll see if it happens. I hope for everybody it does. Um, but over 40% plan to exercise more. And, you know, we saw brands like Lulu lemon who's been one of the clear winners throughout this pandemic um i'm a huge lemon fan myself really win because obviously they're in the athleisure category people don't want to wear suits right now they want to wear sweatpants and they want to feel comfortable at home but lemon jumped ahead back in july and it was actually late june and said we're going to buy this company mirror which is basically a hardware company, which shifts sort of an interactive mirror to people's homes and allows them to exercise. And now Lululemon is trying to create essentially an omni-channel experience for consumers that includes uh, physical retail, includes online retail, and now has a product in the home which can collect data, drive a better first-party relationship with consumers, and really differentiate Lululemon as an experience brand. Um, so we talk about Peloton and all these companies, and you know I think you're going to see categories that are disrupted are gonna be disrupted as much from the startups as they are from companies like Lululemon who are taking advantage of the market opportunity. Um, you're gonna see a company like Zoom who has a crazy uh, stock price right now that values their company at over $130 billion, use their stock as currency to purchase um, you know, maybe old world companies or ways that they can come in and actually leverage their stock currency to basically be a more sustainable business post pandemic. And I think you're gonna to start to see that happen uh, more and more. Uh, despite all this, um, you know, nearly a third of consumers are still shopping inside more than they had before heading into the holiday season. People want things to do uh, in per certain places like Los Angeles, Mayor Garcetti really is, is putting the hammer down and saying like, no indoor shopping, no anything, uh, you know, during this crazy second wave they're facing in Los Angeles, but people still want to shop. They're looking for things to do and they can't go to the park anymore in the Northeast and many areas of the country. And for good reason, the saving rates have been astronomical. This is the personal saving rate. You can see in 2020, at one point, the personal savings rate, which is savings as a barometer um, of uh, income, had, was almost at 35%, just literally off the chart. You can see kind of it came back down a little bit on the right-hand side. Um, and it's now a little bit um, you know, more in line, but we're still seeing um, savings rates at a level we've never seen, which means we are heading into a season where consumers have more discretionary expenditure power than they've ever had, um, despite the fact we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so there's business opportunity at the same time, and this is probably the ones that I've talked about during the most amount of my webinars, you know, we're seeing e-commerce adoption unlike ever before, right? And we talk a lot about this Bank of America stat where over an eight week period from March to April, there was a bigger growth in e-commerce than there was the 10 years prior. 2009, only 6% of all commerce was e-commerce. In 2019, right, that was 10 years later, it went from 6 to 16%. In an eight-week period, it went from 16 to 27%. Many estimates, people are saying that 30%, 32% of all e-commerce could be at the end of this year. And somebody just, uh, Lauren wrote, long before COVID, NASDAQ was forecasting by 2040, 95% of all purchases will be through e-commerce. 
True. But it's really the acceleration of that adoption that is creating the business opportunity because you're looking at over 10 years of growth happening in an eight week period. And it, that continues to rise um, as we head into it. So much so that UPS this week announced they're going to be slapping shipping limits on the gap in Nike to manage e-commerce surge. The e-commerce infrastructure is breaking right now. It's buckling um, at the edges right now because there's so much demand uh, for e-commerce. And this is something, and I, I wrote about this on LinkedIn, that you know Wall Street has said many times, where they call these uh, group of stocks or companies stay-at-home stocks. And they'll talk about Zoom and Peloton and companies that really did incredibly well directly as a result of the pandemic. And in the same breath, sometimes they'll add companies like Amazon and Shopify as part of that, e-commerce companies. And that's where they have me lost because when consumers generally get used to buying certain product categories online and they like that experience, they normally don't go back. And you look at groceries, consumers that have shifted their grocery consumption um, to Instacart likely aren't going to go back um, and go into the stores because it's saving them time and in many instances it's saving them money. So I think you're going to see this e-commerce surge continue and in no way revert post-pandemic. And that's something that um, you can bank on. It's something I'm personally in investing a lot in. Um, in terms of e-commerce, it's no surprise that we're seeing things like computer hardware just blow out because computer hardware is something that is really a necessity right now. You know, desktop computers were on their way out. Companies like Dell were long struggling um, with, you know, consumers shifting to the mobile device and shifting to iPads. And now everybody needs a, you know, a, a computer hardware device in the home. They need a laptop. They need to be able to conduct communications and work and school, et cetera. And now you're seeing companies like Dell have a renaissance and Microsoft got in the hardware space and surface. And, you know, their demand is, is, is dry, is being driven as a result of it. Sporting goods as people want to get more active. We'll talk about vehicles, but these are the fastest growing e-commerce categories that have happened during the pandemic. Health and beauty being the one that comes as the most surprise to me because you'd think that that would be one that would be at risk as people go out less. Um, and companies across the board are seeing it. Speaking of health and beauty, you know, you see L'Oreal here, you know, seeing a massive increase of um, e-commerce as a percentage of sales um, up to 80% uh, you know, now. And again, you, the spike that L'Oreal is seeing is really emblematic of the spike that so many companies are seeing uh, where consumers have no choice but to purchase um, online. And it, it's forced many companies. Now you see a company like Century 21, which is a off-price retailer in New York, they filed bankruptcy. And the reason why is they didn't have a proficient online channel strategy. And when the pandemic hit, they got exposed and they went out of business. And, you know, it just shows that it's never too early to be an innovator and uh, an early adopter, because, you know, if you're not, if you're not, you can really expose yourself uh, when things happen. Um, so we see e-commerce continuing. I know um, our great team just popped up this pop up again in terms of next week, but we're going to be uh, really diving into e-commerce uh, even further um, heading out of this. So um, in terms of travel, uh, over 20% of consumers plan to visit family who they haven't seen during the second wave, despite restrictions. You know, this is a time of year where people want to get together with family. Many people are really, you know, struggling with how to deal with, you know, really the dissonance behind wanting to see your family, prioritizing relationships, and at the same time, not wanting to put the, their loved ones at risk. And it's happening right now. Um, we're seeing travel also sort of evolve right now. This is a funny tweet by Meg Walton that wrote abundantly clear. A ton of New Yorkers with no business behind the wheel bought COVID cars this summer. I mean, there's a lot of bad drivers on the road because more people are buying cars and more people are buying cars. Uh, this is another thing that I wrote about in my book, Youth Nation, that I've talked about as recently as last year that has changed. You know, the notion that millennials really needed cars a year ago was crazy in a world where the ease and ubiquity of Uber and Lyft and the urbanization trend in millennials made them really put buying a car to the bottom of the list in terms of what's important. But now we're seeing the renaissance of that as consumers don't prioritize moving in the city. You know, millennial consumers, we're seeing that play out in the real estate space. They can't travel the same way they used to in terms of booking a $200 flight to, to Iceland, right? So now we're seeing a resurgence of auto brands and used cars. So um, used cars are one of the hottest markets right now for consumers. It's tricky because the prices have gone up and, you know, the auto companies have gotten sort of another, um, another bite of the apple. At the same time, you're seeing companies 
companies like Tesla and the electronic vehicle uh, industry exploding in investment and valuation right now uh, because you know, there's that huge wave of innovation that's going to be hitting and Tesla's starting to prove out the model that the auto industry is going to change. So insane, uh, you know, winds of change happening right now in the auto industry. Um, companies like credit card companies are also moving just for travel. This is interesting. This is Chase's ultimate rewards page where normally, you know, Chase would really want you to push using your rewards for travel. Um, credit card companies traditionally make the most amount of margin on travel, especially international travel and that's why they really push that but now you're seeing not travel um first but third behind apple right they're saying use your uh credit card points for apple rewards and there's you know because it's the holiday there's a new iphone out and it just goes to show how different companies are responding um companies like JetBlue are betting on travel to revive this happened a couple of weeks ago but JetBlue announced a variety of new regional routes um, especially the scariers like Telluride um, saying, you know, we think consumers are still going to get out. This is our opportunity to grab some market share and kind of zig while everyone else is zagging and cutting routes. So I thought that was uh, very interesting as well. And of course, Airbnb, who uh, recently filed for their initial pu uh, public offering and a company that really struggled at the beginning of this pandemic will probably come out of this being one of the large winners. Um, I think consumers have forever changed their view of the, you know, the, the safety of staying in a hotel. I think as more consumers buy cars they, and they really look towards domestic travel uh, more than international travel for foreseeable future, Airbnb becomes a big winner. Now, is there pent up demand for international travel? Of course. Here's the problem with international travel coming out of this. International travel is subsidized by business class travel, which is paid for by companies. And I do believe that business class travel is going to change forever. Uh, you know, this is Southwest CEO saying maybe 10 years before business travel, you know, remains the same. So basically what's happening is as less consumers internationally travel for business, there's less people spending $7,000 on a round trip business class flight to London. And those $7,000 tickets subsidize the cost of people sitting in the middle seat in the back row flying to London for $500. So as a result of it, it's going to become largely unattainable for quite some time for people to be able to travel internationally. And because of that, we're going to start to see a domestic travel boom. Who's going to who's going to win in the domestic travel boom? Companies like Airbnb. So that's where I kind of see this all kind of playing out moving forward. So yes, Amex CEO says there's huge pent up demand for travel. The question is what type of travel and where people are going to be going, uh, which is really the question. So we're going to go into our final section, uh, sink or swim, what brands can do to stay afloat. I'm going to go in first into our last Ask America question. So I'll let you guys go through. I'm going to take a glass of water and choose the question that you want to see our panel most answer. Okay. And I must say, as somebody who does these webinars, sitting here in my apartment in Brooklyn on a clear, sunny day, not seeing anybody, used to being on stage last year I spoke, um, I probably did 50 speaking gigs around the world um, in front of huge audiences. And it was amazing. It's weird to be behind here behind a, uh, you know, a ring light and a camera and seeing so many people engage, seeing uh, so many people stay on. We have uh, way more people on now that even started the webinar. Usually I look at them like, oh, are people leaving? Oh, no, is that not boring now? Seeing it grow, it's, it's great for me. It makes me so excited to be able to deliver value. So I just wanted to say thank you guys for spending your busy time uh, with me today. It really means a lot. So 87% uh, of people expect the same amount of engagement from brands during the second wave, if not more. So consumers, you know, they, they want brands to continue to engage, but they want to see less advertising from brands this time around. It goes back to what consumers want in terms of people being helping brands. You know, consumers want helping brands, brands that help them actually get through this. Over a third of consumers said they want brands to stop changing their products because of COVID, meaning stop trying to overcorrect for what's happening right now and just help me live my life instead of coming out with all these new products that I might not want over the long term. And we ask consumers what they want uh, through our Suzy platform. This is everything from shipping to be free. Um, they want brands to adapt, uh, guarantee safety of the delivery. So the vaccination of the the supply chain and things like that. Um, you know, these are all things that con consumers care about fair treatment of workers, um, especially if a company is doing well. That's something that consumers really care about. Um, David Abro, keep it simple. I agree. I think companies do need to keep, keep it simple uh, for sure. Um, 
this time, you know, consumers in this way, we, we were asked by a lot of our companies because we service most of the large consumer packaged goods brands um, that exist in the, in the, around the world. There are a lot of them are asking us about are consumers stocking up the same way? And there, there has been an increase of volume based purchasing, especially through channels like Costco as of late, but not that panic buying the same way there was the last time. They are pretty much assured that supply chain will be able to um, deliver. And there's that uh, state of Florida again, uh, really promoting themselves as a, as a tourist destination. So uh, they're obviously doubling down on getting people down there right now. Um, this is interesting. It's from Jeff Freeman, uh, CEO of the Consumer Brand Association, said, I'm not going to be a Pollyanna and say things are perfect, but we're in a different place than we were in March and April. Even retailers rationing is a demonstration of the lessons we've learned. Um, so we have learned our lesson. And I think, you know, retailers are really starting to understand how to anticipate and deliver on expected demand. Um, and all this leads me to my last slide, which is where are we going? Like who's going to win coming out of it? And I'm going to be spending a lot of time over the next couple of weeks as our Q4 uh, business madness starts to die down. Um, and I have nowhere to go over the holiday season. <laughs> so I'm going to have, you know, a unique time that really start to think about what 2021 is going to start to look uh, at. And I'll be working with the team on a 2021 predictions webinar. But, you know, I look at the companies that are going to win in the future really starting to win um, across these three areas. By the way, can everyone hear me? I think so. Hopefully, yes, okay, thank you. Um, so, you know, I really think that, you know, the three areas that people are gonna be able to win, the three verticals are safety, speed, and connection. Uh, that really becomes the three areas where I think companies can really stand to win uh, coming out of this pandemic. So, so what do I mean by safety, speed, and connection? Safety is going to be top of mind coming out of this. Consumers are really going to want to make sure that they feel safe anywhere they go, anything they buy. And that's going to be really a big kind of lever of this. They're going to want speed. Consumers have gotten used to getting things on demand through this. And, you know, I went to a retailer. I'm not going to mention a retailer because it could be our client and we don't want to end the year with losing a customer. But I went to a retailer and uh, I wanted something for my son for the holidays. And they didn't know if it was there. And the person had to go back in the stock room and check it. And I had to get back home and I'm looking at my watch. And they came back out and said, they're not still sure. And then they found it and they had to wait in line. And, you know, consumers just don't have patience for that anymore if they go to a retailer. So here I am trying to support other businesses, local businesses, um, other retailers. And, you know, I'm finding myself regretting it because they don't have speed. Um, and I think speed's a big part of companies are gonna win. And lastly is connection. Consumers are gonna want connection. They're gonna want in touch and feel. They're gonna wanna connect with other people coming out of this. So I think companies that can embrace safety and speed at the same time, like Instacart, right? You can get your, um, you know, some say how can Uber be safe during a pandemic? And what I mean by this is, this is 2021. So coming out of this, Uber is gonna be a safer way to travel than arguably Delta, right? Because you're not gonna be subjected to crowds. So I do think people who don't have cars are gonna be able to adopt that. Teladoc or other platforms that let you uh, embrace, you know, um, e-health um, and, 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 and see doctors remotely, you're going to get the speed and the safety of seeing that. So I think the healthcare space is going to be reinvented from companies like Teladoc um, and ZocDoc, et cetera. Safety and connection means you need to connect with other people coming out of this, right? But you want to do so in a safe way. So Airbnb is a perfect example of that, right? WeWork is a perfect example of that where it could be smaller office spaces that you can rent for a smaller basis. We use a tool called Breather at Suzy, or we did until recently, to basically be able to have safe, small conference rooms where our executive team uh, can meet. And then lastly, um, speed and connection. And that's where like Zoom is winning right now. So, uh, and no matter what your brand is, I think this is what consumers are going to want. They're going to want speed, safety, and connection. And how you play um, within these concentric circles, I think are, it's going to be really highly correlated with how successful you're going to be uh, coming out of it. So uh, that is my presentation for today. We are going to go into some uh, Q&A. So um, let me bring in uh, my trusty partner, Abel. Abel, if you want to pop in right now, and uh, we can start to discuss. Abel. He always pops up sooner rather than later. So let's hope he's going to come in here. Here he is. How are you going? How are you? I thought I lost you for a sec, buddy. No, I'm, I'm here. So first, I'm going to share kind of the results from our 
uh, survey that we ran in real time while you were kind of doing this presentation. So the first question that we had here is, um, how do emotions uh, impact spending behavior during COVID? And about 50% of consumers said that they uh, either agree or strongly agree that their emotions have been impacting their spending behavior. So um, I know that definitely has impacted me and I've definitely made some impulse purchases uh, as well there. What, what, what? What'd you buy, Abel? Uh, I recently uh, acquired a Peloton, so I, I I was watching your your presentation. I was like, oh wow, I am a uh, I am just like basically every one of these trends. <laughs> yeah. You are um, the prototypical millennial. I am I am the quintessential millennial. So here, what are some activities that people are doing to be more creative uh, during the second wave here? Um, so you see a lot of, I think this kind of goes into what you said in terms of the COVID-19, um, you know, weight gain here. So people are looking to exercise, um, but people are still cooking and crafting, they're reading, um, they're playing games, they're cleaning, they're decorating. Um, there's people who are starting to celebrate the Christmas holiday, uh, baking. So a lot of those activities that we saw pretty early on uh, in COVID have kind of still continued on uh, as people look for ways that they can kind of be creative in their homes. Um, and our final question here is, what types of new products can brands provide uh, during wave two of COVID-19? Um, so here we saw that a lot of people are focused on ways that they can protect their homes. So sanitize, um, cleaning, sanitizer, face masks, things that keep them safe, things that kind of protect their health. Um, they're looking for new technology uh, and things that can really keep them entertained during this time. Um, so those are kind of the results that we, we did in real time, um, which is pretty cool to kind of see the power of Susie in action there. Yeah. Thanks, Abel. Um, get some questions? Yeah, sure. So Matt, one question for you. Uh, you kind of brought up the fact that consumers are uh, saving at an astronomically high rate. What are your predictions that consumers will do with kind of this newfound savings? Um, will they spend it post pandemic or do you think they're kind of kind of sit on it? I think it's both. I think that we are going to see uh, numbers come out of companies like Amazon Shopify in the fourth quarter that we never even expected could be possible for companies to actually perform. You know, Amazon's a company that had uh, their Amazon Prime Day on October 13th and 14th. And then obviously they had Black Friday where they participate disproportionately because people were not going to retailers. I actually drove around New York City that day to see if there, there was going to be any retail traffic and it was empty in Soho, it was empty at Bloomingdale's and on 59th Street. You're start, and obviously New York City is not the country, but you know, it, so it went to show that there's more market share. And then we just saw Cyber Monday. And I think that people are gonna be buying things. If people are home, they're gonna, and, and they feel lonely and they feel sad, many people are gonna do therapy through shopping, right? A retail therapy, and they're gonna buy things for their home that maybe they don't really need and you know many of the things they're going to buy are going to be things that are going to help certain categories and i think many companies are going to have a really great holiday season in terms of that and at the same time i do think you're going to see tremendous pent-up demand for you know you saw what happened in taiwan with the ultra music festival which is crazy like i think coachella when you can go to coachella safely will be sold out instantly younger people everyone who says younger people don't want to live in cities they're all moving out to the suburbs they don't realize that that that, that's taking away the rite of passage of youth, right? They want to be around other people. They want to have experiences. They're not going to decide that they don't get that just because they were born five years later than, than their older brother, right? They're going to jump out there. And I think that we're going to see a huge rebound in a lot of the hospitality. I have a lot of friends in hospitality and restaurant nightlife, and I feel for them, right? And they so many of them built great businesses. And I do think if they can get through this and survive, they will see you know brighter days ahead. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting that you mentioned that about Black Friday. So I was actually in the suburbs and I went to a mall on Black Friday. Uh, and traditionally you see, you know, just the most insane amount of lines. And this year there was almost an empty parking lot when it came yeah. to Black Friday in the suburbs. And it, it was yeah. just like nothing you would ever imagine in your yeah. life. Now, now, Mall of America, I hear, was full, right? So it's, you know, it's not, it, it is, it's not spread evenly around the country. But I do mm -hmm. think consumers that have gotten used to buying things online are just going to, it's going to be their new way. Definitely. Um, okay, so next question for you. So a few weeks ago, we saw that Peloton, Zoom, uh, and other kind of technology companies saw a plummet in the stock market uh, coming out of the, the vaccine kind of being announced. Um, so kind of what is your take on, on this? And um, do you think the stock market is necessarily going to be indicative of how consumers are going to be post pandemic? Um, or what do you think? Right. So and I kind of mentioned this during the webinar. And obviously, I am not I, I'm not making official financial recommendations. You know, I'm not a financial analyst. I just play one on TV. But um, 
I think that all, you know, what, what the stock market and what the business media likes to do is they like to tie everything up in a neat little bow. Right. And I think in that regard, what they like to do is saying, here are your work from home stocks that really boomed during the pandemic. And you have Etsy and Zoom and Peloton um, and Wayfair and all these companies that have incredible performance. And now when there's a vaccine, ever you should buy Delta stock and Marriott stock and you should sell this, the, you know, the, the stay at home stocks. And I just don't think it's that simple. Right. I think that, uh, you know, first of all, grouping e-commerce companies, like I mentioned, like Amazon and Shopify, that is laughable because, you know, we are just beginning. We're now in the second inning or third inning of e-commerce penetration. Uh, you know, we are just starting to see so many more categories get online, even auto with companies like Carvana. So I just think that, you know, I don't believe that you can group it all together. Now, what you're going to see with a lot of these companies is they're going to have to compare with astronomical 2020 growth rates in 2021. So if Lululemon is growing online sales 300% this year, you know, their year over year comp rates are going to be almost impossible next year. And all of a sudden you see a company that's growing 300% or whatever their number was to 10%. And that becomes a risk with some of these companies. So that's sort of the flip side of it that I think a lot of these companies are going to contend with heading into next year. So that's kind of an interesting point. These companies are, are seeing that 300% growth. In your opinion, how do you think they best sustain that growth in a post-vaccine Diversification. Growth? So, you know, look at Lululemon buying Mir, right? They're saying, okay, we know in-home fitness. And in-home fitness is something I think will catch on. If you are exercising in a, in a Peloton or using a mirror and you feel like it's, you're effective doing it, then why would you then start to spend money to have to go to a sweaty gym with other people when maybe COVID is still in the back of your mind? Right. So I think, you know, now Lululemon has another touch point. They've used the power of their brand and their stock value to purchase a company that diversifies their business base. Right. So if I were Zoom, I would start to say with our stock trading at astronomical levels, how can we use our stock as currency to buy, you know, a company that we I know will be here that, you know, that, that sells, I don't know, mobile phones or whatever you name it, just so they can start to diversify coming out of this. So I think that's what I would do. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Like I, I, as much as you kind of said that about Peloton and kind of the online grocery shopping, I feel like I'm a living testament to that. Now that I've on, you know, ordered Whole Foods delivery, I don't see a world where I would ever go back into it in, in right. store. It's kind of interesting um, just how much uh, that is. Um, so another question here, Matt, obviously higher education has been drastically affected by this. Um, there's been definitely a, a shift in kind of the value exchange there when you're taking classes via Zoom. So how do you think uh, higher education will or won't be changed permanently? I mean, it's a great question. I think that education has been a laggard, right? And it has not sort of evolved um, pursuant to the needs of, of the business world. And many things that are being taught in school, I mean, my kids are not being taught in their school how to use Excel right now, right? And But they're being taught how to do complex calculus problems. And I have a problem with that because the reality is most people aren't going to be doing those complex calculus problems in a workforce. They're going to be doing using a spreadsheet. So why aren't they taught to learn the, the skills necessary to help them achieve if that's really why they're being educated to begin with? Now, I, I know the traditional educator will say, well, it's the thought process of going through, you know, the different types of that's fine, but maybe it should be done differently because that form factor doesn't make sense. I think it's not just, you know, uh, K through 12. I think it's colleges as well. And I think if you look at the companies that are really, you know, tearing up in terms of valuation and redefining this world, they're technology companies, right? Technologies eating the world. I, nothing I was taught in creating and building Suzy was I taught in college, nothing, right? And I think people, it doesn't mean that people shouldn't go because I think for people who can afford it and not get into debt, it's an incredible personal development and social development experience. But if you're going to college to learn the skills needed to succeed in a you know, diversified global workforce. I'm not so sure college is the place anymore. Now, if you're a doctor, you need to learn how to do surgery. You gotta go to college to do that. So I think it's hard to answer that. It's almost a webinar, it's all oh, right. Maybe something we should uh, program for 2021. Definitely. Matt, uh, some people have some questions about the audience um, that is kind of um, behind some of these yep. survey uh, data points. Can you tell us a little about the Suzy audience and where that comes from and all of that? Sure. So the suit, we have our own proprietary panel of over a million U.S. consumers that's been being built for the last seven years. Uh, we have a gamified uh, 
mobile application called CrowdTap, C-R-O-W-D-T-A-P, uh, which is available both on Android and iOS, where consumers download their earn digital rewards for essentially answering questions and interacting with brands. Uh, and that is essentially uh, the platform that feeds into our Suzy tool on behalf of our clients. And we have a great team um, really spread across the country now that's working to build that audience, make sure we have national, uh, you know, statistical significant representation, good quality audience, and it's a big differentiator of the Suzy tool. Got it. Um, and Matt, if, if people are interested in kind of running their own surveys on the Suzy audience, how do they do that? And how can they kind of get in contact? I mean, we are very easy to contact and go to our website, suzy.com. I will put my information on the screen right now so you can actually um, know how to contact me and um, I will connect you uh, with the right people at our organization to give you a demo of Suzy and uh, you know walk you through how it works etc and if you can't see it just Matt B at Suzy.com uh, very easy and I'm sure we'll send out an email to everyone uh, who joined this presentation uh, so you can get that information as well awesome Matt, uh, and one one final question for you so um, you obviously see people um, avoiding kind of physical experiences like gyms. So how do you think places like that um, can convince people to come back in a post pandemic world? Um, it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, I think that gyms are going to have to look at it as more, you know, some people go to gyms not to work out, but to socialize. A lot of people love going to offices, not to work, but to make friends like me and your friends, right? Able because we met through work. Right. And it's like, I think that gyms need to push that aspect because what don't you get when you're on your Peloton at home? You don't get to see other people and meet other people. And I think while gyms may in the past have tried to sort of have it be a thinly veiled social club where it's really about working out, they might have to flip the script on that. And that's sort of my best answer without giving it too much thought. Awesome. All right. Well, Matt, that's really all, all the questions for you, but thank you so thank much. You. For this has been great. And thank you, Abel, and the whole team for bringing this together. You guys, as always, do an incredible job. So this would be nothing without the work that you guys and the team do. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, until next time, we'll see you soon. Thanks, all.